Okay, I'll get started. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the worst project ever. Now, um, I'm, I have these letters ADF, which is Application Development Framework. This is the tool that I'm using, uh, Oracle Application Development Framework. Anybody in here know Oracle ADF or use it? There are a few of you. Okay, great. If you're not using ADF, I think most of the lessons here are sort of um, generally applicable. Of course, I have to have a disclaimer, like if you've ever been to sort of a vendor presentation like Oracle or Microsoft. And so this one is, you know, all projects here are, of course, fixtures and any similar similarity to other projects, living or dead, is purely coincidental. So, of course, don't believe that this is something that actually happened on a project. It's sort of, I'm just sort of imagining what might have happened on a project if we didn't run it as well as we did. So I've been involved in a number of train wrecks, which sort of qualifies me to talk on this uh, topic of, um, of failed projects. My name is Stein Westerly, and I am trying to make the world a better place, like many other people, and my way of doing it, that is to help people use appropriate information technology to meet their needs, to reach their goals. So that's why I'm, I love going out to conferences, giving presentations, and sharing my knowledge. Say, this is what, in my experience, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. I come from the Oracle world, so I've been working with Oracle tools for a long time. Uh, now, latest Oracle ADF application development framework. Um, Oracle, I have this uh, title of Oracle Ace Director, which means that Oracle sort of recognizes me as an expert, but I'm not an Oracle employee. They just sort of support me, they bring me in, give me briefings, etc., and I go out and share, and share my knowledge. I'm also a partner in a company called Scott Tiger, and the Oracle people among you might recognize why that, that name. Um, but if you don't, uh, this is the story. This is not actually uh, us. This is not Scott Tiger. This is Oracle Corporation. It's their first birthday. There's a cake there with one candle on it. And the guy there, that's Bruce Scott. That's actually the guy that our company is indirectly named after. He was Oracle employee number four, or actually the first real employee, because he, the other three are the founders. And he was the first person to, he wrote the memorable words, create users, Scott, identified by, let me think of a good password, yes, the name of my daughter's cat, Tiger. So that's how we came, there came to be this demo account, Scott, Scott slash Tiger, that, you know, Oracle, generations of Oracle developers grew up with. And it's been there in the database ever since Oracle version 2. And uh, as you might know, you know, there was never a version 1 of the Oracle database, because the guy here out on the, on the left, anybody can can anybody recognize him? Sure. Sure. Who is it? Larry it's Larry Ellison. Yes, it's a very young Larry Ellison, and he was always the salesman. And of course, he knew that when he, if he came out with the Oracle database version one, he would buy version one of anything. So he started out with version two, and the rest is history. So, this is the most important slide of the whole presentation, um, to me, not to you. But to me, because this means that what I'm doing here is marketing, so I'm working now, and if I didn't show this slide, you know, this would be vacation time. So, so this is very important. So I work for a consulting company, and we do consult with, with people, and if you want us to help you on ADF development or, or support your projects, then uh, please come up and have a chat, then you can have a business card. Okay, so we start with this project. This, of course, completely imaginary project never happens. So, um, but the first thing that the first mistake that happened was we were a subcontractor. So we were a subcontractor to the people who actually have the contract who would talk to the customer. You know the game of telephone. You spit, put people in a circle and they will whisper in in the ear of one person and they would tell it on and pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. That's the what happened in our project. Because every time there was a requirement, you know, the requirement would come from the user to somebody, somebody who was writing the requirements who would tell it to the main contractor, who would tell it to me as a subcontractor. And I couldn't understand a thing of what they said. What are they meaning? So I would say, do you mean this? And the whole thing would go through the telephone back and another answer would come back. So, um, so that's mistake number one. Being a subcontractor is, 
is not a good place to be if you have these rigid rules saying you can't talk to the customer. I can't talk to the user. I have zero chance of building of building a useful system. But um, of course, instead, because we couldn't talk to the user, but we didn't have to talk to the user because we had requirements. Yes, we had this big binder full of requirements, and of course, that's like everything we needed to know, right? So, um, so we started. Um, so we read the requirements uh, document, and then, then we kept come to mistake number two. Mistake number two was there was a fixed price, and the details. Then there were requirements, but sort of the details. We'll have to work the details out later, right? So. This was like the this is like the, uh, the the frame that we had. This was what the price was, and this was what was sort of added on to the project as the detailed specifications were written. So it's like going out to a builder and you agree, okay, let's build a house. Okay, you agree with the builder what the what the cost is and how many square meters it's going to be, and you know we'll figure out the rest of the details as we go along, right? The builder will not go for that. Sounds like a job. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so that's but that's apparently something that that happens in the IT world. So, uh, so that was the project that we had. We had uh, a specific number of resources and a lot of stuff, um, a lot of stuff to put into it. Then, then we come to. Of course, we had a lot of stuff to build. Then we come to mistake number three. Mistake number three was. You know, we had the whole team from the beginning. The guy, the manager, you know, he says, "I'll go up and find out what they meet, what they need." In the meantime, you, the rest of you guys, start coding. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so ramping up a project, like if you don't have a ramp up phase in a project, but you just have this big binder of requirements, and then you have, and okay, and now we have the kickoff, and everybody started. So, so this was our, this was our development team. <laughs> so, um, so we sort of ran off in uh, in, in different directions, um, and uh, yeah, it um, yeah we didn't get started out on the right foot. Then, um, okay, so that was mistake number three. You know, having the full team up front. Um, then we come to um, mistake number four was, of course, we had we suffered from a. A classic case of chronic feature creep. So we had this one binder, and you know the details were to be worked out. So this one binder became like a stack of binders, and then as this stack of binders grew, what happened was that the it, it turned out that the application was actually not really being designed by by one person, it was being designed by committee. And you know, designing by committee, that just meant that people would be arguing about this feature or that feature, should we implement this way or that way? And what happens in, an, in, a, in a discussion like that, if nobody's willing to sort, if you have a committee, you don't have a leader, you just have a committee, a bunch of people discussing it, it's say, let's do both. So whenever there was a feature that could be implemented in two ways, one person wanted it in one way, one person wanted it in, in the other way. So of course, and you could read the requirements either way. So of course, the requirements just grew and grew until they were, they were the union of everything. So this was like our requirements. <laughs> and we were going to build this system to solve all problems. There's another problem that's, that's inherent in this way of doing things with the, with the binder, you know, the waterfall method, is that now we have the project. So what we'll do is we will spec that this application just has to be so flexible and configurable that we'll never have to build another system. So you know it has configuration here and there. Basically, the customer is specifying that if he were ever to come up with another attribute that he wanted, of course, he should just be able to configure it into the application wherever he wanted it, display it in whatever way he wanted. And that's what all these binders, um, that's what all these binders said. And of course, we have the problem here from the last slide, is that, um, so this was our project manager, and this tank here was sort of the customer. So whenever there was a discussion, our poor project manager was completely rolled over, um, because 
if you have a well, it's bad enough to have this kind of this kind of we'll work out the details later project. Sometimes that works if you have a project manager, a strong project manager who's willing to stand up to the customer and say, that's not in the requirements. No, we're reading the requirements this way. No, but we should have. Where does it say in the requirements? But our poor project manager was totally uh, rolled over, and we ended up with this uh, with this humongous big uh, project that we were that we were going to build. So, um, so we're not so we're not really we're not really doing very well. Um, then we come to the fifth problem, the fifth challenge we met was that we weren't really we weren't really very good at the tool that we had chosen, or or to put or to put it another way, we had the full team up front, but we didn't really, we had like a five day training class with the new tool, and then okay, go off and program, right? And we went off and programmed in a hundred different directions, and it didn't matter what we it didn't matter if it was if we had screws, because what we had was a hammer, and they were going in, and um, and that was we were really using we're really not using the tool. Um, the tool in an optimal way. Right, so let's see, yeah. Some of these challenges, we hit some challenges that were really, they were fairly hard. Like this is ring riding, I don't know if you have it over here, but you're supposed to put your little lance through this ring and it get the ring gets smaller and smaller. And sometimes we had sort we have had challenges in this project. We had things that we needed to do that were really, really hard. And we were trying to do, we were trying to make our tool do this thing the, the way the customer wanted. And sometimes there were just things that the tool couldn't do. So we tried to, um, we tried to have a discussion with the customer saying, you know, this thing that's specified this way, the tool doesn't actually doesn't work that way. Like we have a tool and if we could use the tool this way, it would be really easy, but doing it the way that it's spec right now is really hard. So we would tell, so the developers would tell the development manager, who would tell the project manager, who would tell the committee, who would tell the steering committee, who would tell the, ask the users, and the user would say them no or say something back. And you know, it came up, the committee would argue about it and our project manager would get uh, rolled over and we would be back to, um, you know, building uh, the whole thing in whatever way we uh, we thought. So then we come to okay, we have a lot of we have a lot to build. We have limited re limited resources. So we come to mistake number seven, which is uh, well, that's a bit dark here. Well, too bad. You know the the um, you know the uh, the artist trick with the spinning plates. Uh, this is the picture of the spinning plate. You have this little stick and a spinning plate, and if you run around fast enough and keep moving these uh, sticks, all the plates keep spinning. So I was running around trying to keep all these plates spinning because that was basically um, my task. Because I was doing lots of stuff, and we were just too few people to do too many tasks. And if you overstretch somebody in the project, then um, well, sooner or later, you know, the plates are going to start falling off, and that was the um, that was the place that that we were we were ending up. So um, I was doing like these eighty-hour work weeks, and my boss was happy because it looked good on my uh, good on my timesheet. Until of course the point we reached the point where you know we had spent the time that was allocated for the project, then he was less happy. I was still doing eighty-hour um, eighty-hour weeks. So. Um, Having too few resources, of course, is a problem. The deeper problem here actually is that if you have somebody who has programming, uh, programming capabilities, even if you have the programming skills, don't assign that person the role of project manager. You shouldn't manage anything. If the project manager can code, it doesn't matter if he wants to code, if he has the ability to open an IDE and start writing code, that's a project risk. Because what happens when you get late in the project is that, you know, oh yeah, I mean, we need this module, this is really hard, and I know this tool, I'm one of the guys who knows this tool best, so I'll just code this little module, and I code this module, and I'll fix this, and I'll fix this, oh, and I have a compiler error, and this thing doesn't talk to that thing. And I would be coding, which of course meant that, you know, I'd be keeping like a few coding uh, plates spinning, in the meantime, you know, all of the project uh, plates behind me were just falling back, and you know, everybody was 
There was no communication. Uh, everybody was doing their own thing, running off on their um, on their own. So, so we were getting um, we were getting a bit late um, with our deadlines. Of course, because we were building so much, but we had these uh, we had these limited resources, and we were working and working and working, and we were completely exhausted. But at some point, you know, the deadline came around, and we come up to um, we come up to uh, mistake number nine. That is, we released the code, um, and we got the bug reports. And you know, the testers weren't really happy because um, because once you if you have too much to do and you have too few people to do it with, well, you know. I've been drawing the project triangle on napkins for people. It seems like forever that there is, there is, you know, there is the price, there is the scope, and there is the, the quality, and you know you can choose any two. But uh, once the if the if the, the the effort or the price is fixed, and the scope is fixed, well, you know that uh, tends to affect the last part. So we weren't really. Um, we weren't really releasing very good quality. We had lots of bug reports. So, which takes us back to uh, to basically to error number four, because you know this was what was promised to the customer. This was what the customer was expecting. This great big banana split with uh, with everything and cream and cherries on top. And you know this was like the resources we had. So. Um, so of course that's um, that meant that you know we had a hard time delivering and we were not living up to the living up to the expectations of um, to the expectations of the customer. So and then we had um, the last part is so we had some technical uh, some technical interesting technical discussions with uh, with the customer. Now if I Go on. This is my home banking system back home in Denmark, and if I press the back button in my browser while I'm in my home banking system, I get something like this: "There is a system error. You've been logged out. You come back again later." Um, but what happened was that we were building a modern, rich internet application that runs in the browser, where you navigate with buttons and menus and all sorts of things. We were building a wonderful application. And the user came up to us and said, but if I press the back button, I want to go to the last screen that I was on. Uh, this is a rich internet application. Like it runs a million lines of JavaScript to repaint the screen, and it gives you this nice desktop feeling. Oh, I just want the back button. <laughs> oh, damn, that was too bad. Because you know we've built the whole application, all 300 screens of it, as a rich internet application that uses JavaScript and repaints the screen and does partial page rendering and Refreshes only the parts that's that's necessary. And we were very proud of our application, and the user wanted the back button. So, um, so that's uh, that was um, yeah. We had to, we're trying to explain to them what could what would what would work and what wouldn't work. But um, there's a, there was a disconnect there between. Um, I think it's probably a generational thing because what happened was that people who were the older people in the on the customer side, they were used to web applications that would one web page redraw the whole thing, another web page redraw the whole thing. The younger people are used to reach internet applications. You click here, something updates, but it does never refreshes the whole screen. If you press the back button, you'll be back at where you were before. But we had built a rich internet application, but some they were expecting some of the users were expecting something else. So we had. Um, yeah, we had some other uh, interesting, um, some other interesting challenges is with sort of the, the web thinking that we weren't really communicating well to the customer, and that was the whole the, the whole idea of of uh, running an running the application in separate tabs, because our users would start running our would start another tab with the same application on it, and we were we had this. It, you can run your application several times if you have independent browser sessions, and to us, that's a technical. Technically, it's an independent browser session. Okay, it's independent if it has its own session object. Of course, it's obvious to any programmer what an independent browser session is, isn't it? It's not obvious to the users. The users think, you know, if I open a new tab, I have a new browser session, I can do new things. 
Uh, unfortunately, we were using session objects in our, in our application. So that meant that the user would search, up, search one record, go to another tab, find, a, find something else, make a change, and committed that he would actually be saving the the other tab as well. So we were had, we had been miscommunicating with the users. We had been using our technical terms. We say this is an independent browser session, but the users don't understand the term an independent browser session. To them, a new tab is an independent browser session. So if you want to run the application, be upfront about you know this application runs in one tab, if you try to open it in another one, it will stop, it will detect it, it will kill it, it will die, or horrible things will happen to your children, whatever. Um, but you need, to, you need to fix that up front to say how the application runs, and that was uh, like we were have been doing our technical communication and not really communicating at, it, at the user level. But we, got, we went through our various uh, issues and we kept uh, working on it, and you know, resources were pouring down the drain. And but at the end, we finally delivered our application. <laughs> so, um, so and it it was there, and it rolled along <laughs> slowly, but it was there. And um, yes, so that was our that was um, that was our project. Uh, worst project ever, it need not have happened that way. We could have done, we were doing, well, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a lot of agile and various uh, nice methods here, but I come from the enterprise world where things go out with RFPs and, you know, big binders. And some of this stuff is it, there, that's risks that's simply inherent in working with the waterfall method with the, with the binders. But if you're working with the waterfall method, as long as you have communications, but we have we didn't have a line of communication from the developer to the to the end user. If you have a line of of communication, it'll work. If you don't have a line of communication, then your waterfall method, your waterfall project is likely to fail. And I suspect that a reason why agile projects have might have a higher they don't I'm not sure they have a higher success rate I don't have any data on that but what happens is that agile at least has the idea of the user being close to the programmers and that can make up for a lot of for a lot of things you don't see agile pro agile projects running into the ground having spent 200 million and producing nothing but you do see wonderful projects uh, of that kind happen. Then, of course, um, our era two. So, you know, the customer we had sold, or the, the um, as the vendor had sold, you know, the uh, the, the customer like uh, one foot of rubber band, right? And you know, so one foot of rubber band said, "Okay, this is what I want," right? And that was, of course, uh, that was of course a challenge. That was just bad project management. There's nothing we need to. Nothing we need to say about that, other than, than don't do that. Um, we had, of course, we were starting out with everybody, with a full team. Of course, you need to start small, build a proof of concept so you know the technology, you have the, have the time to ramp up. Um, yeah, we had the feature creep, which comes back to, you know, the, is, is it this application or is it this application that we're buying? We need to, you need to learn the tool. Of course, again, with the ramp up, if you start out with a few people who learn the tool, and built up some experience with a proof of concept, then you have a much better chance to onboard some other people later and you don't have you know, your development team running off in all sorts of directions. Then of course we had the issue that you know, nothing was getting prioritized. Everything was like, everything needs to, need to be fixed. Every issue fits in somewhere here. And the developers are the ones who place things on the easy hard scale because they can tell you what is easy to fix, what is hard to fix. And the business places things on the important, not important scale. So every issue belongs somewhere here. But if you don't get, if you don't get the, uh, the communication with, if you don't have the communication with the business, and, every, and everything is a priority. When everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. So if we're not, if we're not being guided as developers to stay up here, you know where we're going to, where we're going to be staying? Out here. And we'll be fixing the easy, and what's worth, we'll be working down here in the easy, not important quadrant, 
which is definitely not the place where a project, especially a project that's late and overdue, uh, should be working. So it comes back to the communications, communication thing. If the customer, if you don't have the communication with the customer and can find out what's important, then, then, your effort, then you're not making the right effort. We had our issues um, you know, with, with the overstretch, which meant to led to less communication, and etc. Well, of course, you need to staff, staff your project appropriately and, uh, and don't assign program, project management tasks to a programmer, because like a programmer like me, if I can get, get to code, you, you know I know I should be project managing, but I'll just fix this little issue over here in the corner. And I think it's a, it's a risk if you have the, the capability. You need a project manager who don't, who don't know code. That's, uh, that's, probably, that's probably safe. Yes, and of course, you need to build the proof of concept. Some of the issues that we had with the, with the multi-sessions and with the, with the back button, that would have worked if we had released something early, a proof of concept that the users could work with, and they could figure out, they could figure out things, how the application works. So if we are going to build an application that is going to be separate web pages, that's fine, we could do that. Our tools can do that, but we need to know it up front and we could have figured that out when we, when we were doing the, the proof of concept. Yes, so I think that was our 10 uh, don't do's, the 10 things that, uh, that could hypothetically have happened in a project that I was on. Uh, and you've learned um, how, uh, yeah, you've learned how not to do it. So, uh, so um, now you go out and make your projects, um, yeah, work the way they're supposed to. Thank you. So, if you're interested, in my I'm on Twitter. I have a web page and send me an email. Any questions? How long did it take to implement the current back button? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we did. We got. Um, we did. What we did was we had. Um, we were actually store. We were actually storing the. Uh, we were storing the session variable. So people would press the back button, and they would be taken back to their sports site or whatever. But if they press the forward button, what we could work around was we could, if they press the forward button, they would be back where the where the application uh, left off. But that was probably like two months of engineering because it was not an assumption that was built in. So we weren't storing things. In the end, we were sort of uselessly or needlessly making the application like, you know, stateless, stateful application. Our application was stateful big time because it had to be able, when it came back, it had to have everything. Yeah. So a couple of months of engineering wasted sort of, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Okay, uh, sir. Yeah. I have one. Just a common. Where are you from? I'm sorry. I'm from Denmark. Denmark. Okay. Uh, is it a common uh, concept in Denmark for developers to tend to become project managers? Because in Latvia, that's that. Well, in my eyes, it's in my, uh, in my view, it's a it's a huge problem because universities teach that that. Uh, a way for a developer is uh, the best way to, to evolve is to become a project manager, which I think is quite a huge bullshit. Uh, yeah, well, so it's, is, it, it, is it common in Denmark? It's a it's a it's a challenge in Denmark as well. Yes, I've been uh, through all through all of my uh, all of my career. I've been sort of clinging to the rug every time people want. Don't you want to be a project manager? Don't you want to be a team leader? Don't you want to be a manage manage manage? So no, no, I want to code. And, but that is uh, it is a common it is a common challenge um, in with with um, in Denmark as well. So yeah, yeah. I don't see I don't really yeah. see what what I what we can do about it. But uh, yeah, there's this tendency. Okay, you can do it. You're the most experienced uh, programmer, so you'll be the boss of the programmers. But I'm not a good boss. Like I'm a good programmer. Okay. So yeah, I recognize the the, pro the we have the challenge, and I don't really know what to uh, what to do about it. Huge marketing program. Yes. All, throughout all, all university. <laughs> yes, yes, no, but we had, we have it. Um, I was actually, I was working with a project, uh, project model once. We had this at a risk factor. It was adding up. You were adding up risk factors. Just had a checklist, and one of them was, was this: the project manager is able to code. It had a weight. <laughs> yeah. That was a risk factor. If, it, if that was, the, if that was the case, it was added up in the formal project risk management model. That was clever. That was, uh, yeah, that was insightful because it is a risk. Okay, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.